Music Lyrics and The Crucible by Elias. A Studio 113 production. And we are actually live to the world now. Okay, well, what I did is I created a soundtrack for the Crucible movie. And the songs that I use all um, discuss all of the themes and the lessons that could be learned. You know, I answered the contract, the questions. And, well, I guess I'm going to begin now. Um, <laughs> the first song I chose is a song called Gravedigger by the band Architects. And the themes that are, dis that are discussed here are greed. Um, the song itself is about corrupt politicians and, you know, their ideas on how to run the government like and foreign policy and things but I was able to take the lyrics and compare them to the court in the crucible I was able to take the lyrics and compare them to Abigail and the girls and what they were doing like the very first line I don't know if I should go ahead and play the song um, the very first line right there it says an iron fist and a velvet glove another vulture posing as a dove and I guess I'm gonna play that line now <laughs> Morning. It's kind of heavy music. <laughs> that line right there is a—it's a metaphor, and it. The iron fist in a velvet glove, all that right there, it represents the townspeople only accusing other people of witchcraft to, for, to progress further in their own personal agenda, to get what they want more than anything. Like, but um, the people on the outside, they see them as doing, you know, the work of God because they're accusing people of witchcraft, you know, they're in league with Satan, it's only right. But an example of people only accusing someone to further progress their own personal agenda and get what they want would be like Thomas Putnam when he accuses people to take their land. And the second line, which I guess I'll play now. He said, do you have no shame? Look at what you've become. This, I felt like he was speaking to... Abigail, Mary Warren, and the girls who were pretending this entire time to be attacked by, you know, demons and spirits, the yellow bird, and they were doing that and they were making themselves look like victims when in fact they were the ones causing harm. Um, they jeopardized people's lives just to get what they want and to get out of trouble because, you know, they were dancing and doing that ritual with Tituba when they should have been receiving the punishment. Instead, they turned that around and made other people get punished for their actions. And that's what I thought. And the next line goes to the chorus. <coughs> okay. Um, the chorus of the song goes like this, well. If you hear what he just said, he said that line right there, line number three. History repeats, we've seen this all before. We've given the vampires the keys to the blood bank. And that, um, that's another metaphor. Just like the people who were wrongly accused in the Salem Witch Trials, the author of this play, Arthur Miller, was being accused of being communist. You know, um, I didn't read too much on that, but that's just another comparison between Arthur and the Crucible and how we've seen this law before. We saw it happen in the Salem Witch Trials and we saw it again during Arthur Miller's lifetime. And that's just that. And that's the end. That's this song. Now we move on to song two, which is a song called Bed by the band called Brand New. And the themes here are lust and guilt. And a lesson you can learn from this is to fight sinful temptations. The whole song is like I said there is probably a reference to Paradise Lost by John Milton and well I guess I'll play the song now it's not a heavy song so don't worry <laughs> 
This song, this line in particular, was really hard for me to analyze and compare to The Crucible because that's really vague, but what I got from it was that, like in the poem, Adam and Eve are in an argument, hence the lit and fire um, analogies, they're hot-headed. This could be also compared to the argument between John Proctor and Elizabeth during the one scene in the movie where it was, to some people, boring, but it was honestly really filled with a lot of tension, and that's what I got from this line. And then the chorus, which I'm going to play now. <laughs> okay. That's not it. <laughs> but. The chorus goes later on the bed, and that I also was really hard to interpret because the lyrics here are so, he's not really straightforward with what he's trying to say, but basically, at the end of the poem, Adam and Eve have become lustful towards each other, just like John Proctor became lustful towards Abigail, and that's what led to the previous line, which is where Abigail, I mean, where John Proctor and Elizabeth are arguing. And then, well, and now the second line, which I just played. But. This line was the easiest one because if you put yourself in the perspective of Elizabeth, and you, and, the, you t and you pretend that the singer for one moment is Abigail, it only confirms Elizabeth's suspicion of Abigail trying to have her killed. My eyes are lungs, I'm a prophet, and I speak in tongues, I know how you'll die. That to me was like as if I was Elizabeth, and that's Abigail basically telling me she's going to get me killed, she's going to get me hung. And that's what I got out of that line, and that's the, that is the second song on this on this album. Um, I only made it five songs because it would have been too long if I added more. So. And the third song is probably the saddest song here. It's called, again, it's by the same band, Brand New, but the song is called Jesus Christ. And the themes here are loneliness, regret, guilt, and a lesson learned here is to, you know, if you're religious, then repent, and before you make a dumb decision, think twice. So, I'll get the song out now. This song is also really sad, so. What the singer is saying here on that line, if they don't put me away, it would be a miracle. He's saying he doubts that salvation could truly help someone like him. Like, maybe he's done something so bad he really fears that he won't be able to be saved from this. I feel like this could be applied to Abigail after she realizes how badly she messed up. Like in the scene where she went to talk to John Proctor and tell him that she had, t that she had um, money to go to Barbados. But when John refused, she finally realized just how bad she messed up and she finally came to that realization and was forced to leave. So if they don't put me away, that it will be a miracle. You'd have to put yourself in the perspective of Abigail for that line. And the next line.
what that line says right there as well that in this case the singer is praying and he's asking Jesus what did he do those three days that he was dead before he resurrected because his problem and both Abigail's problem are going to last more than you know Saturday and Sunday and that's what I feel is probably what was running through Abigail's mind after she jeopardized people's lives and basically destroyed the town and left with you know Reverend Paris's life savings and she's just looking back and reflecting on what she's done And at the gates, this Thomas asked to see my hands. And again, this is just in the perspective of Abigail and what she's done. And this is an allusion to John 20, 25, where um, one of Jesus' disciples, Thomas, did not believe in Jesus' resurrection until he saw the holes in his hands. So what this is saying is she fears getting rejected from heaven after doing what they did. She's, he and she are wondering if, you know, will they... Will Thomas ask to see their hands? Will they be rejected from heaven? And that's the third song. And now we're moving to the fourth song here. And this one is 818 by a Christian metal band called The Devil Wears Prada. And the theme here is that, you know, even bad things happen to good people. And well, the title and the album name is an allusion to Romans 818, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And well that, what that means is that the amount of suffering that you're going through right now is nothing compared to what you're going to go through when you know you finally go to heaven, when you're finally saved. And that's what this song is about. It's if you didn't understand that he said they ask why we suffer oh God please answer and well that's basically saying he's questioning he's asking God why do bad things happen to good people why do we suffer because people every day get wrongly convicted of a crime that they didn't commit and they end up you know possibly getting the death sentence or life in prison for something they didn't do I related this to the crucible because everybody who was accused of being a witch or doing or being involved in witchcraft was not really a witch or did anything wrong but they were accused of it and died for it and that's what that line is about and that the second line is hmm. The city mourns another loss, but we'll pray forever. That line reminded me of the scene where John and the two women were actually finally executed. And the entire city, instead of, you know, being happy that, you know, they're being hung because they were accused of witchcraft, instead they mourned their loss because it's like deep down they knew they did nothing wrong, that they were being wrongly killed, and that they will forever keep, you know, their memory alive in prayer from that point on. It also made me think of, like, you know, John's children who are going to have to live the rest of their lives without him, and they're going to forever keep, them, keep him alive in their heart and in prayer. And that's what I got from that line. And the final song 
which is probably the most uplifting song here is called Dear God by a band called Being as an Ocean and the themes here are forgiveness, love, peace, happiness and a lesson learned here is you know you could you, you should learn to forgive, forget, love and enjoy life and well I'm gonna pull the song up now Carson's classroom yeah Can you go back later? Yeah. Thank you. And the line that I had in mind goes something like this. And from what I, what I got from this line was, I put myself in the perspective of John Proctor about to be hanged. And I bet, and this is what I thought was probably running through his mind, he's about to die and he's finally just decided, you know, he's gonna die, he's gonna die for his faith. He's gonna die knowing that he can forgive those who've done him wrong and he knows that everything that is happening to him is only gonna further mold him into the person that God intended him to be. He's doing it because of his faith, and that's what I got from that line. And line two is something like this. That line, he said, I write these things to remind myself that amidst this darkness, there still remains light, hope, and a perfect plan. John and the people who were hung with him never lost their faith, and they died with God in mind. And that concludes my presentation like it concludes the Crucible movie. Thank you.